Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Arghadeep Lashkar. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Bombay. And I will be uh, offering this topic on deflection of statically determined structures, which will be basically consisting of three sessions. Uh, in this topic, I would mainly uh, deal with the calculation of deflections of structures under which are statically uh, determinate. Uh, there are uh, indeterminate structures which whose deflections can also be calculated, but in my uh, stock, uh, the, mostly the deflections of statically determinate structures would be covered. Um, if I look at the contents of my uh, talk, uh, I would first start with uh, an introduction about uh, the necessity of calculating deflections, why we need to calculate deflections. And some of the methods that I will cover are shown on this slide. You can see that I'll be talking about the double integration method, uh, the McCullough's method, which is basically a, a special case of a double integration method. Then I'll talk about moment uh, area theorems, conjugate beam method, and finally I will talk about two energy methods which are based on the principles of conservation of energy. One is the virtual work method, and the second one is the castig lyons theorem. Now, for today's lecture, in, I'll first talk about the introduction and the elastic beam theory based on which the double integration method, the moment area theorem, and the conjugate uh, beam methods have been developed. So in today's uh, lecture, I would cover double integration method and McCullough's method. Um, I would like to uh, have the questioning after uh, a session of the talk. So what I would do is uh, I would uh, first uh, cover up to the double integration method and then I would open the session for questioning for all the participants and then I would take maybe like a five minute break and at the end I would cover the McCullough's method. In to, uh, the lecture on 26th of February I would cover the moment area theorems and conjugate beam method and finally on 4th of March I would cover the energy methods. Now moving on with the introduction of this uh, Topic. So first of all, uh, why do we need to calculate structural def uh, deflections? Uh, most often when we design structures, we have the first thing that comes into our mind is the strength of the structure, whether it is adequate. But in addition to paying attention to the strength of structures, it is also important to calculate the deflections. And the, there are various reasons for which the deflections can occur in structures. Main thing is due to the loads, the structures will deflect because no structure is practically or completely rigid and in other addition to the loads uh, deflections might be due to temperature changes in the structural members or due to some fabrication errors or due to settlement of the structural supports so these are the various reasons due to which the structure might undergo deflections and in order to ensure that our structure is stable and the integrity of the structure is uh, maintained we need to be able to calculate the deflections of these structures now there are various other reasons for which we need to calculate the or for deflections of structures. There are a number of structural materials such as uh, concrete, which are mostly used for civil engineering structures, are brittle, and hence they fail without giving much warning. Hence, it is necessary to prevent the damage of these materials, and in order to do that, it is also necessary to calculate the deflection of such structures. Regarding the serviceability, uh, we need to avoid excessive defle uh, deflections and vibrations in structures because it will render or make the occupants of those structures or users of those structures unsafe. And finally, as I said, uh, there are indeterminate structures whose deflections and analysis will not be covered in this uh, uh, lecture, but we can calculate the forces or internal forces in these indeterminate structures by calculating the deflection of uh, the statically determinate structures, which is a precondition for analysis of uh, indeterminate structures. Now, before I go ahead further, I would like to just point out that uh, in this topic, uh, that all the deflection calculations will be limited to structures which have linear elastic material response. When I say that, I mean that if you unload the structure, it will, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it will return to their original undeformed position. And for also, if there are two different sources of load or deformation, then the total deformation of the structures can be calculated by calculating the individual deflections due to the individual loads. In other words, what I mean is the principle of superposition is applicable. 
Now, in order to calculate the deflections in structures or displacement or <coughs> rotations in structures, we need to be familiar with the various kind of supports that that these uh, structures have. So, some of the typical support conditions that are encountered in the common civil engineering structures are shown on this slide. The first one is like a roller or rocker support, which basically restrains the movement or displacement of the structure in only one direction, that is perpendicular in the direction perpendicular to the support. The second one you see here is on this slide is a pin support, which basically restrains the displacement of that structure at that point in all three directions. The third support condition that we normally, we most uh, commonly in, uh, encounter in civil engineering structures is called a pick support, which restrains the displacement as well as rotations at those supports. And the fourth one you see here, a fixed joint connection, which is normally common in a frame member. And what in this fixed joint connections, the rotation of the two members which are connected at those joints are equal. In other words, the joint rotate the displacement at those joints or the rotation at those joints are allowed, but the two members are the rotations of those two members are uh, equal. Finally, the last connection that we encounter in uh, civil engineering structures are the pin connected uh, joints. And in this kind of joints, the members are independent to move. Uh, irrespective of the rotation or deformation of the other member, the two members which are connected are free to move uh, by themselves. Now, before I start with the first method of calculating deflection, I would like to give a small background about the elastic beam theory based on which the first method, that is the double integration method, is uh, developed. So, as I'm sure that if you all have taken any classes on strength of materials or solid mechanics, you all have been familiar with this elastic beam theory, but I'll quickly recap. So, if you have any uh, a structural beam that is shown on this slide, you can see that there are different kinds of internal forces that develop in that beam due to the external loads. Now, the three more, most common types of internal loads that develop are the axial force, the shear force, and the bending moment. Now, deformations in a structural member can occur due to all three of these internal forces. However, it has been noticed that for members like structural beams, where the span to depth ratio or the is much higher, in other words, the length is much greater than the depth, the deflections are primarily caused due to the bending internal forces or the bending internal bending moments. Now, in order to be able to calculate the deformations, we need to find a relationship between the forces and the deformations of the structure. So, what we have done here is we have taken this beam and we have taken the x direction we have to have for, as towards the right. So, it starts from this point A and the x its distance is measured along the span of the beam towards the right. The deflection of this beam is measured in the vertical direction. So, the any deflection which is upwards is measured as a positive vertical deflection. Now, due to the action of these internal load, due applied loads, there will be internal moments that develop in the beam. So, in order to correlate that internal moment with the deformation, what we have done here is we have taken a small section of the beam which is for having a length dx and we have separated it out here. Now, initially it is a prismatic section. So, as you go over the depth of that section, the length is dx. Now, once this beam is subjected to the external loads and it bends, it will be subjected to some internal moments m and it will deform because of which it will have a deformed shape like this. Now, in this case, at a distance y from the center or the neutral axis of the beam in this case, the deformation, the length of that element would reduce. So, if you want to consider, find the strain in that element, it is given by this expression that you see here, which is rho minus y d theta minus rho d theta over rho d theta. Now, here rho minus y d theta is the deformed length of that element, where rho is the radius of curvature of this element, y is the distance of that section we are considering from the neutral axis. And d theta is the angle that is formed at the center of this curved element. 
so that is the strain in that element so rho minus y d theta is basically the deformed length of that element and the initial length of that element is the same as the length at the neutral axis which is rho d theta so that is the increase in length and that divided by the original length gives you the strain so this basically gives you a relationship between the radius of curvature of that deformed of that deformed element and the strain now if you recall your solid mechanics principles you know that the stress in that element would be given by this term my by i where y is the distance from the neutral axis so now if you combine this stress and the strain in this relationship which is the relationship of stress and strain using the young's modulus for a linear material you get the 1 by rho is equal to m over ei so this is the relationship between the radius of curvature of that deformed element and the external the internal bending moment which develops in that element due to the applied loads so so once again if we come look back at that relationship 1 by rho is equal to m by ei now again um, this relationship this dx is the length of that or the width of that element and that can be written as the radius of curvature times d theta so here what we have done is we have replaced this 1 by rho by d theta by dx and we have taken this dx to the other side so what you get is d theta by m over ei into dx now if you remember the from your geometry uh, learnt in class 12 the radius of curvature is given by this relationship which is the second derivative of v with respect to x over 1 plus dv dx square whole to the power 3 by 2 now in this study what we are considering is small deformations in other words the rotation is where dv dx is basically the rotation of that beam element now for small rotations this term dv dx square is much much less than 1 or in other words we can say 1 plus dv dx whole square is almost equal to 1 so we can say that 1 by rho is equal to dv dx square so when we substitute this here instead of 1 by rho we write dv dx square we can say m by ei is equal to dv dx square so this basically relates the this basically relates the internal moment that develops due to these applied loads with the deformation that is the term v in this equation now remember this is the basic equation that will be used to develop the three methods that i'll discuss that is the double integration method the moment area theorem as well as the conjugate beam method so in all these uh, three methods you will be first this will be the starting point now just keep in mind that since we will be using this equation there are certain assumptions that we have made to, in order to derive this equation and these are the assumptions so first of all there is no horizontal displacement along the elastic curve by this i mean that if you apply these loads this beam is deflected in the vertical direction but it does not deflect in the horizontal direction the beam deflections of is only due to bending so there are, might be axial forces and shear forces also in the beam but we neglect the deformations in due to those axial forces and shear forces in the beam the beam material is homogeneous in other words this e is constant and it is linear so it means that it is uh, once you remove the loads it can go back to the original condition and also the principle of superposition is valid and last but not the least just keep it in mind that this equation can is valid for small deflections because we have neglected this term one dv dx is whole square when we have substituted it this equation in the the top equation so now we come to the double integration method which is the first method for calculating deflection of structural members that i will discuss today so as i mentioned this is the the starting point of this equation is this uh, the relationship the second order deformation equation that we developed that we saw in the previous slide so m by ei is dv dx is equal to the second derivative of the displacement with respect to the um distance along the length of the beam now if you integrate both sides of this equation you get dv dx is equal to m by ei right now here dv dx is the slope of that beam at any any section if you integrate both sides of this second equation you get 
V. So integration of dV dx is V and you get double integration m by di. So this is the basic uh, uh, principle in this method where you basically integrate the m by ei function of the beam twice to get the deflection and once to get the slope at any section. So here theta is the slope of that elastic curve of the beam. Theta is the slope of the elastic curve of the beam at any section and v is the deflection. Now before I proceed further, I'd just like to draw your attention to the sign convention that we used in this method for specifying <coughs> excuse me, the theta and the v. So in this case, for the beam, we considered the distance towards the right as the positive x direction and we considered the deflection in the upward direction as the positive deflection v. Now for the rotation, if it is counterclockwise, in the other words, if it is in the for a positive x direction, if the deflection is towards the positive v, then that rotation is positive. It is considered a positive rotation. So this is the sign convention for the positive rotation and this is the sign for the, the vertically upward direction is the sign for the and the vertically upward direction is the sign is the sign for the positive deflection. Now coming back to that equation for the for this elastic curve, which is the basically the deflected profile of the beam. Uh, we all know that if we integrate this moment function of the beam, which is basically uh, expression in terms of x, which where x is the distance from one end of the beam, what we get is we'll be getting some constant of integration on the right hand side. So those constant of integration have to be evaluated in order to be able to calculate the deflection of the beam at any section or in order to get the equation of that elastic curve. So the elastic curve calculated using this double integration method will have the two constants of integration. Now in order to determine constant of integration what we need to do is we have to provide the values of either v or theta at some known points on the beam. In other words those are the known as the boundary conditions. Now beams with discontinuous loads will have multiple functions within which are valid within the range of discontinuities and the continuity conditions in that case must be used to evaluate the integration constant in the elastic curves of adjacent discontinuities. So I'll have two examples which I'll be showing after this. So once we go through that exa those two examples, uh, these four sentences would be a lot more clear. So this is the first example uh, that I want uh, to discuss with you. It has a simply supported beam and it is subjected to an external moment M0 at one of its ends. And what it is saying is for the beam loaded as shown in the figure below, determine the equation of the elastic curve using the double integration method. And they are also asking uh, determine the values of the maximum deflection and maximum slope of the beam and the locations at which the maximum deflection and the maximum slope will occur. Now one of the prerequisites for this course or for this talk was uh, the students or the audience should be familiar with the bending moment diagrams and shear force diagrams and axial force diagrams of structures. So you know, so any structure is given and any loading is given, you should be able to draw the bending moment shear force diagrams and axial force diagrams. So we'll start ahead with the solution, we'll go ahead with the solution of this problem and what we see is if you draw the bending moment diagram of this beam, this is what it will look like. It will have a moment of M0 at the end A, at the end B which is a roller support, it is having zero moment. So this is the bending moment diagram and the moment function of that beam that is the moment at any distance x from the left end is given by this equation M0 1 minus x by L. Now in order to calculate the equation of the elastic curve that is the displacement function of this beam at a distance x, what we have to do is by the double integration method, we'll write D2V, D2V dx square is equal to m by ei and instead of m, we'll replace it by this term m0, 1 minus x over L. Now if you integrate both sides of this equation, you get dv dx on the left hand side and on the right hand side, you will get m0 by ei x minus x square by 2L plus there will be a constant of integration C1. If you integrate it one more time, you will get v is equal to m0 by ei x square minus 2 minus 
x is cubed by 6L plus C1x plus C2. So these are the two constant of integration that I was talking about in the previous slide. So whenever you try to solve the equation, the deflection function of or try to get the deflection function of a beam using the double integration methods, you will always encounter these constant of integration which you have to solve using the boundary conditions. Now for the boundary condition of this beam, it was a simply supported beam. So the deflections at both ends should be zero. So at x is equal to zero, the deflection that is v is equal to zero. If you put in this equation, the last equation that you see here, if you put v is equal to zero at x equal to zero, put x equal to zero here, you will get c2 is equal to zero. The second boundary condition for this beam was at the other end, that is at the end b, the deflection is zero. So if you put x is equal to l, at x equal to l, v is equal to zero. So if you come back again to this equation, you put x equal to l here on the right hand side and you put the value of v is equal to zero. And if you solve it, you will get C1 is equal to minus M0L over 3EI. Next, what you do is you put the values of these constant of integration that you obtain using the boundary conditions back into these equations. If you do that, what you get is V is equal to M0 by 6EI, X square minus 2 minus X cube by 6L minus LX by 3. So this LX by 3 is coming from this term ml by 3ei so that m0 by 3ei has been, it's been taken as common and so you are left with lx by 3 in the brackets. Also similarly if you put the value of c1 here you will get dv dx is equal to m0 by ei x minus x square by 2l minus l by 3. So now this is the equation for the deflection of the beam at any distance x from the left end and this is the equation for the slope of the beam at any distance x from the left end. Now this is the first part of the problem. They had also asked you to calculate the maximum slope and the maximum deflection of that beam. Now since we have the equation for the deflected deflection uh, elastic curve of the beam that is given here v is equal to m0 by ei x square minus 2 minus x cube by 6l minus lx by 3. What we can do is in order to find the location at which the maximum deflection occurs we just take the derivative of this. In other words, we take the expression on the right hand dv dx is equal to this, we equate this to zero. So the point at which the maximum deflection occurs at that point within the span of the beam, normally the dv dx that is the slope of the beam is equal to zero. So we have to find the location at which the slope of that beam is zero. that is what we have done here in this slide. So in order to determine the location at which the maximum deflection occurs, obtain the value of x at which the first derivative of the elastic curve equation is equal to zero. So take this equation of the elastic, uh, of the first derivative of the, of the elastic curve and equate it to zero. So that will basically give you this expression x, is, uh, x minus x square by 2L minus L, Q, L by 3 is equal to zero. If you solve this, you will get, this is a quadratic equation you will get two values of x. One is x is equal to 0.422L and the other one is 1.56L. That value of x is within the range of 0 to L. So x cannot be 1.56L. In other words, what I am saying is the equa this equation of this elastic curve will have either a maximum or minimum value at 1.56L. But in our case, for the case of this problem that we are solving, this is not applicable because it is not applicable, it is not within the range of applicable values of x. So at x equal to 0.422L is the location at which the maximum deflection will occur. So next what you do is, you have to obtain the maximum deflection. So what you do is you come back to this equation for the and you put x is equal to 0.422L in that equation. If you put that and you solve it, you will end up with minus 0 0.064 M0L square by EI. Now this minus indicates that this is a in the vertical downward direction. Remember uh, when I talked about the sign convention for deflection, deflection in the vertically upward direction is positive. So it, once it comes out negative, that means it is in the vertically downward direction. So that is about the deflection, the maximum deflection of the beam. It is minus 
0.064 m0 l square by ei so minus indicates it's in the downward direction and this maximum deflection will occur at a distance of 0.422 l from the left end of the beam now for the maximum slope what we do is we take the derivative of this v dx we take the double derivative so it is d2 v dx square so if you take if you equate that if you equate the second derivative to 0 you will get x is equal to l now if you put x is equal to l in this equation you get the slope is m0 l by 6 ei so that is the slope at the beam at x equal to l but there is one thing that you should be careful about uh, which i will now talk about that this is one of the drawbacks of the double integration method you always cannot take the higher order derivative and equate it to zero and get the location of the maximum slope or deflection uh, in this case what you get a positive rotate a positive rotation at the right end that is at x is equal to l and that is m0 l by 6 ei however if you come back to this equation for the slope of the beam which is dv dx equal to m0 by ei x minus x square by 2l minus x by l in this equation if you put x is equal to 0 that means at the end a of the beam you will see that the dv dx at x equal to 0 is minus m0 l by 3 ei so what does this indicate this indicates that at this end it is having a negative slope that means it is in the clockwise direction at this and notice that the magnitude of this slope at this left end is higher than the magnitude of the slope at the right end so this is as basically to remind you or to show you that you should always uh, take calculate the deflection at the support condition in addition to the reflection the deflections or rotations that you get from the equation of the stick curve in order to calculate the maximum deflection in addition to taking the higher order derivative equal to zero you should also pay attention to the deflections at this so in this case the maximum rotation of the beam will be at the left end which is minus m0 l by 3i and here the minus indicates it is in the clockwise direction so just to stress on that point the maximum positive slope of the beam occurs at x equal to l however the maximum negative slope of the beam occurs at x equal to 0 which is not obtained by equating the second derivative of the elastic curve equation to 0 in this case the maximum absolute value of the slope is at x equal to 0 so at x equal to a the value of the slope is m0 l by 3 ei in the clockwise direction and that's the maximum slope of the beam in this case so this is the first example that I wanted to discuss and there is one more example that I want to discuss and this is for uh, this cantilever beam which is fixed at one end and free at the other it is subjected to a concentrated load at a distance a from the free end and they are telling you that beam is loaded as shown in the figure below determine the equation of the elastic curve using the double integration method and also determine the values of the maximum deflection and maximum slope of the beam and their locations now in this case you see that if you draw the bending moment diagram of the beam this is what it will look like at the fixed end the moment is minus po times l minus a and at distance of l minus a from the left end the moment is zero and beyond that the moment remains constant so this is the bending moment diagram so now here notice that the bending moment if you write the moment function it will have two equations for x between 0 to l minus a it is minus p into l minus a minus x and when x is greater than l minus a and less than l the moment is equal to 0 now to solve for the elastic curve of this beam using the double integration method there are two sets of moment functions that we have to consider one is valid for x greater than 0 and less than l minus a and the other one for x greater than l minus a and less than l
So if you, I'm sorry, I, I just missed one slide which, Yes, yeah, so these are the two equations of the moment function. One is valid for x greater than 0 and less than L minus A and the other one valid for x less greater than L minus A and less than L. Now, if you come to this first equation and you use the double integration method, you can again write d2v dx square is equal to minus P L minus A minus x over EI. Now, if you perform double integration, you get dv by, if you integrate it for the first time, you get dv dx is equal to minus p l minus a x plus p x square by 2 plus this constant of integration c1. To integrate both sides again you get v is equal to 1 by a i minus p l minus a into x square by 2 plus p x cube by 6. Now again you get plus c1 x plus p2 x. Now what are the boundary conditions that you need to be able to solve this constant of integration. These are the boundary conditions at x is equal to 0. This is a fixed end. So at x is equal to 0, the deflection is 0 and the slope is 0. So the two boundary conditions you get here. So you get at x is equal to 0, p is equal to 0. If you put that here, put x equal to 0 here on the right hand side and put v equal to 0, you will be getting c2 is equal to 0. The second boundary condition is at x is equal to 0, that is at this left end, dv dx is equal to 0. So you come to this equation, you put x equal to 0 here, x equal to 0 here, and on the left hand side dv dx is 0. So that will give you c1 is also equal to 0. So if you put the values of constant of integration which are basically 0 here, you will get the equations as v is equal to 1 by ei minus p l minus a x square by 2 plus p x cube by 6. And also the slope of the elastic curve is given as dv dx is equal to 1 by ei minus p l minus a x plus p x square by 2. So this is the equation, so the equation of the deflection and slope of the beam for x greater than 0 and less than l minus a. So what about the portion of the beam which is beyond this point which is at x is equal to l minus a. For that we have to solve this uh, equation, the second order equation for the second e moment equation which is basically mx is equal to 0. Now in order to solve this if you have you have to get two boundary conditions to solve the two constant of integration and those two boundary conditions are obtained from the equation of the elastic curve for the first part which is at x is equal to l minus a. So what you do is in this equation put x is equal to l minus a and calculate the slope of the beam at l minus a. So this is the slope of the beam minus p l minus a whole cube 3 by ei. And I'm sorry, this is the deflection and the slope of the beam at L x is equal to L minus A is minus P L minus A whole square by 2 EI. So these are, this will be the two boundary conditions that we will use to calculate the constant of integration for this portion of the beam, which is between L minus A and L. So this is where we are solving the equations for the second part of the beam which is d2v dx square is equal to 0. For this second part mx is equal to 0. So if you just integrate it twice you get first you get dv dx is equal to c1 and then you get v is equal to c1x plus c2. Now in order to solve this two constant of integration we will use these boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are at x equal to l minus a the dv dx is minus p l minus a square by 2ei. This is what we got from the previous slide and also the at x is equal to l minus a minus the deflection is minus p l minus a cube by 3 ei. So these are the two boundary conditions that we are used to solve the constant of integration for the second part of the beam. So if you put those constant of integration back into the equation you will get v is equal to instead of c1 you will get 
minus p l minus a square by 2ei x plus p c2 is p into l minus a whole cube by 6ei and also the slope of the elastic curve of that beam is given as dv dx is equal to c1 so c1 is minus p l minus a square by 2ei so this is the equation of the slope and deflection for the portion of the beam in this region which <coughs> so this slide is basically summarizing the slope and deflection equations for both regions of the beam so this is for the first part of the beam which is between 0 to l minus a and this is for the second part of the beam and also these are the equations for the slope of the beam one is between x is uh, for x between 0 to l minus a and the other one for x between l minus a to l now in this problem also we had to calculate the maximum slope and the maximum deflection of the beam now in order to calculate the maximum slope and maximum deflection if you look at these two terms or expressions for the slope and deflection for x greater than 0 and l minus a what you notice is that both of them are having terms of x so if x is 0 here the slope is 0 i'm sorry the deflection is 0 and the also the slope is 0 now as you keep on increasing the values of x the value of the deflection and slope will keep on increasing so this will give the maximum value of slope and uh, deflection for x is equal to l minus a from this two equations and if you come to these two equations the first if you look at the slope equation this does not have any x term x here so that means over this length which is for x greater than l minus a and less than l the slope remains constant and this slope minus p l minus a square by 2 by ei is the maximum slope for this region so basically after l minus a the slope remains constant and that is the maximum slope now for the deflection what you do is you can see that it is a constant term here my plus p my l minus a only, uh, p into l minus a cube by 6 ei minus p l minus a square by 2 ei times x so to get the maximum deflection what we do is we put maximum value of x that is possible for in this expression so in this case the maximum value of x is l so the maximum deflection will also occur at x is equal to l so the maximum displacement and slope of the beam are obtained by putting x is equal to l in those two equations so this is the maximum slope which is minus p l minus a square whole square by 2 ei and the maximum <coughs> deflection is minus p l minus a whole square by 6 ei into 2l plus a so these are the maximum deflection and maximum slope at the end b <coughs> so these are the two examples that i wanted to uh, discuss in this uh, lecture now based on our observations uh, on these two examples i have highlighted some points about the double integration method and these are the points that i wanted you to uh, keep in mind whenever you are uh, working with double integration method first of all uh, the double integration method can be used to directly obtain the slope and deflection at any point along the span of a beam from the equation of its elastic curve so if you have the moment function of a beam along its span you can use that moment function to calculate the slope or deflection at any point by the double integration method however there are some drawbacks which as i mentioned and i'll highlight them again beams with discontinuous loads will have separate moment functions applicable to individual regions of discontinuity we saw in that second example that even though there was no moment function for the region of the beam between l minus a and l but we had to consider a separate set of equations and find two separate constant of integration in order to be able to get the equation of the elastic curve for the entire beam 
and continuity conditions must be used to evaluate integration constant in elastic curves of adjacent region. So if you recall the second example, what we did is we first found the equation of the elastic curve between x equal to 0 and x is and x uh, equation of the elastic curve for the region uh, ranging from 0 to L minus A and then using that equation of the elastic curve we obtained the slope and deflection of the beam at x equal to L minus A and these were the boundary conditions for the equation of the elastic curve between L minus A and L. Third point that I wanted to mention is the evaluation of maximum slope and deflection from equation of elastic curve requires checking of absolute values of support. If you recall the first example that I talked about the maximum ro uh, rotation of the beam if you just take it by, by obtaining the higher order derivative and equating it to zero you will you may not always get the maximum absolute maximum value of the slope or deflection so it is also essential to uh, keep it in mind that the slope and deflection at the supports are also considered in order to be able to calculate the absolute maximum values of of these quantities now these uh, this method which is the double integration method are not applicable for calculating slope or deflection beams under complicated loading conditions and support conditions. So if you have uh, deformations of beams due to uh, conditions like thermal loading or some, some other conditions like uh, uh, fabrication errors, then this method is not very much suitable for uh, calculating the deflection or slope of the beam. And also as I mentioned that this uh, plastic beam theory is applicable for members which are having significant deformation due to bending but not any significant deformation due to axial and shear force. So the last point that I wanted to mention about this method is uh, this is not applicable for members having significant deformations due to axial and axial loads and shear forces. So with that uh, I do I have presented what I needed to discuss about uh, the double integration method and what I will do now is I will uh, allow uh, you all to have ask any questions that you might have and if not we will just take a small break of 5 minutes and then we will start with the McCauley's method. So if you all have any questions I would like to hear them now and we can discuss the concerns you all. Hello. Sir, in the example number one, we have mx equal to m0 1 minus xl. Sir, I'm solving it. It's coming m0 1 plus xl. Sir, how it is m1 minus xl? Sir, why minus sign is there? Sir, in the example number one, the moment. If you look at the bending moment diagram of that beam. Yes, sir. This is the bending moment this diagram the bending of that beam, right? That beam, so this right? is the x, and at x and is equal to zero, zero, the value of the moment the is m zero, right? M zero, right? And the equation and I got equation is, I got is m x is equal to x is equal to m zero one minus m x over minus l x over l, right? Right? Now, yes, sir. At x is equal to l, the value of the moment is zero. If you put x is equal to l here, it's one. So one minus one that makes it equal to zero. Now you are saying it is no, m0, m0 1 plus xl. One plus XL. Yes. That is the case that then at x is equal to l. If you put x equal to l here you will get 2m0. So it is basically reducing it is basically it's a negative. So that's why you should have the negative here. Okay, is that clear? Is that clear? Yes sir. Yes. Sir I got the answer. Thank you okay, sir. Thank you. Okay thank you. Okay I got another question through the chat which says uh, why we assume the beam is linearly elastic. Now the reason we do this is because if we do not assume the beam to be linearly elastic then the equation that we started with which, which is a d2v dx square is equal to m by ei that e term is not a constant. So if you do not assume the beam to be linearly elastic the beam would that equation that we are basically using as the basis of our method is not applicable. So that is the main reason why we this method is applicable for linearly elastic materials or beams which are linearly elastic. Okay, um, there's another question that I got uh, which is asking me how to find slope and deflection for continuous beams. Um, now, 
before i started this uh, uh, lecture today i mentioned that this is for statically determinate beams uh, so if you have a continuous beam which is statically determinate all you have to do is if you have a support which is somewhere in between the span you basically apply the support conditions at that point into the equation of the elastic curve to eva evaluate the constant of integration so if it is a statically determinate beam which is continuous then all you have to do is the point at which the boundary condition is imposed you apply the boundary condition into the equation of the elastic curve and you should be able to solve for the deflection and slope of that beam even though it is continuous now if it is uh, statically indeterminate then there are other methods which have to be used and that is not included in the scope of this talk okay um, so if you don't have any further questions i think what i'll do is i'll continue with the lectures and after so we'll now talk about the macaulay's method which is a special case of the double integration method but it is applicable most or it is rather useful for beams which have a discontinuities in their loading like the one we discussed in example 2 under the double integration method so this double integration method for beams with discontinuities in moment function can be simplified using the macaulay's method and what we do in macaulay's method is we use some functions which are called singularity functions and i'll quickly discuss what is the singularity function that we use so the singularity functions that are used to represent the moment function with discontinuities are basically helping us to represent the entire moment function of the beam with discontinuous loading by a single equation now in order to define the singularity functions if you look at the screen it tells you that if you have a singularity function like this which is x minus a to the power n now when they have this enclosed in this box brackets this is called a singularity function now, how do you define this it is for values of n that is the exponential when it is greater than i'm sorry this there's a typing error in this slide instead of a this should be zero so when n is greater than zero the value of this singularity function is equal to zero for x less than a and when x is greater than a the value of the singularity function is just like the normal curve bracket so it is x minus a to the power n now when n again this, this is a error it this should have been n less than 0 not a so for when n is less than a the value of this function is equal to 0 for x not equal to a and when x is equal to a it is undefined now since if we use this functions in double integration methods we'll be integrating and uh, differentiating these functions a lot it is uh, effective to first see the integration and differentiation formulas of these functions so if you have an integration of a step function x minus a to the power n so for n greater than 0 it is x minus a to the power n plus 1 by n plus 1 so just like as if it is within the round brackets however if n is less than 0 it is just equal to x minus a to the power n plus 1 now this is again in the box brackets now for the derivative if you take d dx of x minus a to the power n it is n x minus a to the power n minus 1 for n greater than 1 and for n less than 1 we don't have this n it is just x minus a to the power n minus 1 now again notice that when you are integrating this and you are differentiating this these box brackets remain so that means these are still the singularity functions now we'll see the advantage of these uh, properties of the singularity functions very quickly when we uh, go to the example which is on the next slide so this is all of this is the basic principle of macaulay's method where you apply the singularity function in order to represent the moment function of beams with discontinuous loadings by a single equation instead of using separate equations for each region having continuous loading we'll use this singularity functions to represent the equations of the beam by a single equation so as an example for this method what i have done is i have taken this beam which is if you look at this you can see that it is supported here at a and d so this is not a this is a free body diagram of the beam and it has a concentrated load at this point b 
and a uniform load of 450 newton per meter between points C and D. Now, for your convenience, what I have done is I have calculated the reaction. So I'm sure that with simple uh, equations of statics, you should be able to arrive at these equation, at these reactions. That is, at the left end, the reaction is 480 newtons, and at the right end, the reaction is 920 newtons. Now, if you want to write the moment function for these beams, now they have loadings or rather load discontinuities at point B and C. So what happens is between A and B, there is one equation for the moment function. So for X between 0 to 2 meters, the moment function is given by this reaction 480 times X. For this region between B and C, that is for X greater than 2 and less than 3, the moment function is given as minus uh, x is uh, the 480x minus 500 that is 480x minus 500x minus 2 so that concentrated load which is at a distance of 2 it comes into the picture here for the moment equation between b and c now if you look at the third region that is between c and d the moment function is given as 480x minus 500x minus 2 minus 450 by 2 x minus 3 whole square. So now in this region, even the uniformly distributed load of 450 Newton per meter comes into the picture. So now you see that if you want to solve this by the regular double integration method, you will have three different sets of moment equation. You will have six constant of integration that you have to evaluate in order to be able to obtain the elastic curve of this beam. So now what we'll do is we'll see how we can solve it much easily using the step or singularity functions by the Macaulay's method. Yeah. This is the equation of that beam. Second order equation of the elastic curve of the beam can be written can be written in a single equation using the singularity functions as shown below. So instead of if you go back, so for this region it is 480x, but for this region it is minus 500 x minus 2. Now if you put this in the box brackets or if you rather use singularity functions, then you can use this second term in the same equation. Similarly, if you put this x minus 3 in the within the box bracket, that means when x is less than 3, this term becomes 0. When x is greater than 3, then only then it is applicable. So that is what we do here. We use the singularity functions to express the moment equation of that beam. And then we put it in the second order equation of the elastic curve. So EI d2 v d this should have been v, v dx square is equal to 480x minus 500x minus 2. This is a singularity function minus 450 by 2 into x minus 3 whole square. Again, this is a singularity function. Now, if you look at the properties of integration of singularity function, and if you double integrate on both sides, you will get ei d2y d. Again, this should have been v d2 v dx uh, dv dx is equal to 240x square minus 250x minus 2 whole square. So now notice if you integrate this singularity function, you get x minus 2 whole square by 2. So that 2 is cancelling this 250, you get uh, the 2 is cancelling this 500, so you get 250. Same thing here, 450 by 2, x minus 3 whole cube by 3. So that so that 3 and 2 in the denominator, they cancel this out and you get 75. So this is the first order equation of the elastic curve ei d2 v dv dx is equal to 240 x square minus 250 x minus 2 square within this singularity function and minus 75 x minus 3 cube plus again like we do in the double integration method we also have a constant of integration c1 here again if you integrate the both sides of this equation you will get ei again this will be v 80 x cube so here you integrate this, you get x is cubed by 3, so that 3 will cancel the 240, you will get 80. Again, the singularity function, you can integrate it, it will be x minus 2 whole cube by 3, so you get 250 by 3. This one, x minus 3 whole fourth by 4, so you get 75 by 4, and now you have the second constant of integration, which is C2. So this is the addition of the elastic curve of the beam using the singularity function, and now you see, instead of using three different equations, we have only one equation to represent the elastic curve of the whole beam. 
So all that we are doing is introducing two singularity functions here. One is applicable for x greater than 2 and the other one is applicable for x less than 3. So when x is less than 2, this is not applicable. When x is less than 3, this is not applicable. So now what we have to do is solve for these constant of integration. So if you solve for this constant of integration, we'll have to look at the boundary conditions. Now this beam had uh, the strengths at the two ends. So we say that at those two ends, the deflection is zero. So at x equal to zero, the slope is zero. So that if you put x equal to zero on the right hand side here, all these terms will become zero and put v is equal to zero here, you get c2 is equal to zero. And the second condition is at x is equal to l, in this case the l is five meters, v is equal to zero. So put x equal to five here, so it will be 80 times 5 cube. Now here, if you put 5, 5 is greater than 2. So it, this term will be present. So it will be 250 by 3, 5 minus 2 whole cube. Again here, 5 is greater than 3. So it will be 75 by 4, 5 minus 3 whole to the power 4 plus C1 into 5. And C2, we already we got it as 0 here. So that will give you the value of C1 as, again, there is a mistake here. It is minus 1490. So the value of this constant is minus 1490. So C2 is 0 and C1 is minus 1490. So next thing you do, just like in double integration method, you put these values back into this equation. So if you put these values back here, this is what you will get. EI D2, DV DX is equal to 240 X square minus 250 X minus 2 whole square minus 75 X minus 3 cube. Again, these are singularity functions, just keep it in mind. Again, there's a typing error here. This should be minus 1490. Similarly, the equation for this deflection is given by EI V 80 X is cube minus 250 by 3 X minus 2 whole cube minus 75 by 4 X minus 3 4 minus 1490 by X. So as you see that this is the equation of the slope and the deflection of the beam. Now, up to here, what you have noticed is the advantage of the Michaelis method. Now, what I will now show you is there are some things that even cannot be overcome even if you use Michaelis method. And that is if you are told to calculate the maximum deflection of this beam. Now, can you take the this equation and equate it to zero and that will, will that give you a value of the location at which this deflection is maximum? The answer is no. What you have to do is just like you do it in double integration method, you have to consider three separate equations. So which I'll now show you um, 80 X is cube minus 250 by three, the singularity function of X minus two whole cube minus 75 by 4 singularity function of x minus 3 to the power 4 minus 1490. So this is the equation of the elastic curve using the singularity function. Now if I want to calculate the maximum deflection of that beam, I can say dv dx which is equal to 1 by ei This will become 240 X square minus 250 X minus 2 whole square minus 75 3 to the power 4 I'm sorry there should be an X here C1 X minus 1490. Now, if you straight away equate this to zero, what happens to these singularity? You cannot just store it or take it for calculating the values of x. So what we have to do is just like in double integration method, we have to separate it for three different regions. So for x between zero to two meters, the dv dx will be one by ei 
240x square minus 1490. Now this you equate to 0 to get the location of the maximum deflection. If you equate this to 0, you will get x is equal to 2.49 meters. Now, if you notice that this part of that equation that I wrote here is valid for x between 0 to 2. So, and you are getting by solving this, you are getting x is equal to 2.49. So, it is not applicable at x is equal to 2.49. So, the maximum value of the deflection cannot be obtained at x is equal to 2.49. Or in other words, the maximum value of the deflection does not occur between x equal to 0, uh, x between x equal to 0 and x equal to 2. So now what we do is we take the second equation. So for x between 2 meters and 3 meters. Here dv dx can be written as 1 by ei to 40 x square. Now the second term, this term will come into the picture minus 250. Now since x is greater than 2, then you can just write it using the round bracket. So x minus 2 whole square minus 1490. This term is still not applicable. It is only applicable for x is greater than 3. So but right now x is between 2 and 3. Now if you put this to 0, then you will get a quadratic equation. If you expand the x minus 2 whole square and rewrite it, you will get 1 by ei minus 10 x square plus 1000 x minus 2490 equal to 0. Now if you solve this, uh, you will basically end up with two values of x. This is a quadratic equation. So if you solve this equation, you will end up with two values of x. Now I have just solved it for your convenience. So if you solve this, you will get x is equal to 2.55 meters and 99.5 meters. Now again, this value is not applicable because for this equation, the limits of application are between x is equal to 2 and x is equal to 3. This first solution that we got, x is equal to 2.55 meter is between 2 and 3. So this is the, this solution of x is applicable in this equation. So what you do now is to calculate the maximum value of v, you put x is equal to 2.55 meters and you put x equal to 2.55 here, 2.55 here and you solve it you will end up with minus 2487 by ei. So from this you can see that this is one of the maximum value of the deflection. Now again here you are getting a negative value. So what does that tell you? That tells you that that maximum deflection is in the downward direction. Now this is the second set of equation. Now there will be another third set of equation which will be valid for x greater than 3 less than 5 and for that the equation will be dv dx is equal to 1 by ei to 40 x square minus 250x minus 2 whole square minus 75x minus 3 equal to the power 4 minus 1490. So now notice that even this singularity function at x equal to 2 and the singularity function at x equal to 3, both of them are coming into the equation and both of them have been replaced by round brackets. So this if you equate to 0, this is a cubic, I'm sorry, this should be a cubic equation. So this is a cubic equation. So if you solve this, you will get three values of x. And again, if the values of x that you will get here are minus 0 0.36 meters, 
2.54 meter and 6.68 meter now notice that none of these values minus 0 0.36 plus 2.54 and 6.68 none of them are applicable or none of them are within this limit of x greater than 3 and less than 5 so from this we can tell you that the maximum deflection of the beam does not occur in this region between 3 and 5 so the only region where it occurs is at x is equal to 2.55 meters and the maximum value of the slope is 2487 meters so this is one example that i wanted to discuss with you all and show some <coughs> limitations of the one of the limitations so even if you are able to obtain the equation of the elastic curve that is the slope equation and the deflection equation by solving a single equation but if you have to calculate the maximum slope or the maximum deflection of the beam using this method in, then what you will have to do is again consider the separate equations which are applicable for each region of continuous loading just like you do in the double integration method so, so these are some of the highlights of the Macaulay's method um, first of all it is used to directly obtain the equation of the elastic curve of a beam with discontinuous loads by using a single moment equation with singularity functions so just like you saw in the example if you had solved that example number three using a, a direct integration method you would have solved three different sets of equation and six constant of integration but because you solved it using a college method you just had to solve only one equation and two constant of integration so it is definitely more convenient for calculating slope or deflection at any point over the span of a beam with discontinuous loads however evaluation of maximum slope or deflection from equation of the elastic curve requires consideration of separate equations without singularity functions so if you had looked at that example that i showed and if i, sh I showed you how to calculate the maximum deflection of that beam for that again you have to consider the three separate regions one is between x uh, for x between 0 to 2 the other one between 2 to 3 and the last one was for 3 to 5 now again just like the double integration method that is not applicable for calculating slope or deflection of beams with complicated loading and support conditions and also it is not applicable for members having significant deformations due to axial and shear forces so that is all i had to present about the macaulay's method now if you all have any questions about Macaulay's method I would like to uh, take them right uh, now. Okay, I got a question here which is asking which method is feasible to find slope and deflections of for nonlinear elastic and inelastic structures. Now if you are dealing with the nonlinear elastic and inelastic structures this method this direct integration method uh, may not be applicable or may not be convenient to use the best option I can think of is uh, if you use some finite element analysis that might be helpful for solving uh, slope and deflection of uh, structures with inelastic components when there is strad pro why are we using these traditional methods which one is more accurate okay now this is a good question uh, when there is strad pro why are we using these traditional methods this is just to make you all familiar about the theories that because if you get a software it is always convenient to use but at the same time it is also important for you to be familiar with the theoretical knowledge that is has been used to develop these software otherwise if you make some mistakes while using a software it will be very difficult for you to figure out or uh, come out with the reason why you are making the mistake so using a software is always welcome and it is always encouraged you should be familiar with different kinds of software but at the same time you should be familiar with the basics that are behind the softwares and if you are not familiar with those basics then you might be using the software as a black box and which one regarding the second question which is here which one is more accurate now the ones that i have discussed right now if you are talking asking between direct integration and Macaulay's method you might have noticed that they are based on the same principles so I wouldn't say one is more accurate and then the others now if you are uh, asking between uh, energy methods and uh, 
beam elastic beam theory methods then i would say definitely the energy methods would be more accurate because they consider uh, shear deformation as well as axial deformation in addition to bending deformation what is the significance of the singularity function the significance of the singularity function is the fact that it allows you to combine moment functions at points of node discontinuities if you do not use these singularity functions then you will be you will be basically you following a much more elaborate or much more uh, complicated or much more lengthy procedure of solving this beam curve equations uh, using the double integration method so the main significance of the singularity function would be to combine the moment function of the beam at points of load discontinuity and thereby allow the use of these functions in the double integration method by a single function if a moment is acting at support how do macaulay's method how to use macaulay's method to find slope and deflection if, you have, if there is a moment acting at the support all you have to do first is find the moment function of the beam if you look at the example so if you remember the first example that i talked about where i had a moment acting at the support so this if you draw the moment diagram of that beam this is what uh, this is also the moment function is continuous there is no discontinuity so in this case i would say you don't even need macaulay's method if i'm getting the question right so you just find the moment function or the moment equation of the moment what the length of the beam and then directly use it for in, in the double integration method you don't need to use macaulay's method for this beam okay the next question i got is why macaulay's method cannot be used for member deformation due to axial force and shear load now the basic principle between macaulay's method or double integration method is the elastic beam theory which basically considers the deformation of members due to bending moment and they do not consider the deformation of members due to axial force and shear load so that is the reason why macaulay's method or double integration method uh, cannot be used for calculating member deformation due to axial load and shear forces the next question i have is can we predict directly the approximate place of maximum deflection without undergoing all those individual sections i'm not sure if you are asking about the example that i have discussed if it is about the third the example 3 that i was talking about yes we can look at the beam and we can definitely say that the deflection the maximum deflection of that beam would be somewhere near that concentrated load but to find the exact location and to find the value of that maximum deflection we definitely go need to go through the exercise that i have shown where you take the derivative the first derivative and equate it to zero and then find the location and again put the location back in the equation of the elastic curve and get the maximum deflection how to calculate the deflection and slope using macaulay's method for uniformly varying load now if you write the moment function of a beam with a uniformly varying load what you will notice is that there is actually um, no discontinuity in the moment function so basically uh, you do not need to use macaulay's method for solving a beam with a uniformly varying load you can directly do it by using the double integration method whether we can use macaulay's method for internal hinge problems um, i would rather avoid using the uh, macaulay's method for internal hinge problems uh, because uh, there is a discontinuity in the uh, slope of beam at the internal hinge so i would rather go for double integration methods or some other method for solving the deflections using uh, for internal hinge problems what is the main difference between double integration method and macaulay's method macaulay's method is a special case of double integration method for beams which have discontinuous loads or discontinuity in their moment function so there is no difference in the basic principle of double integration method or macaulay's method but it is macaulay's method is a special case of double integration method if you all do not have any further questions uh, this is all i had to discuss for today or else uh, we'll have the next session on friday with and there we'll be talking about uh, the mo moment area theorems and conjugate beam method which are uh, two more methods based on the 
elastic beam theories of calculating deflections. Okay, uh, so these are some of the assignment problems that I gave for this uh, lecture. The first one that you see here is um, a, a double integration method problem. Uh, what I have here is a beam which has a roller support at one end and it has a support at end B which is fixed but it is not restrained in the vertical direction. There are rollers by which that beam can move in the vertical direction at end B. Now in order to solve this, uh, I won't be doing the detailed solution of this problem. So if this beam is subjected to a uniformly distributed load uh, omega zero, uh, there is no discontinuity in loading so we can uh, easily use the double integration method. So if you write the equation of the moment function, the first thing is to find the moment function. Now in order to solve the moment function, first of all you should be able to draw the free body diagram. So if you draw the free body diagram, you will get a reaction here. and a moment. Now this is omega 0, this is, this is the length of the beam. So if you apply the equation of static equilibrium to this beam and say summation of vertical forces on that beam is equal to 0 will be able to solve for the reaction which will be equal to omega L and the moment would be equal to omega 0 L square by 2. Now to solve the this beam using double integration method what you have to do is you have to write the moment function. Now for that it will be r into x minus omega 0 L square, I'm sorry, omega 0 x square by 2. So this is the moment function that you have to use. Now you do the double integrate, so you write d2 v d x square is equal to mx, in this case it is omega 0 L x minus omega 0 x square by 2. Now uh, you can do the double integration with uh, use the double integration method you will get the well expression now again what we have missed here is 1 by EI. So if you solve for this you will get some expression in x and you will get two constant of integration C1 and C2. Now, how do you solve for C1 and C2? What are the boundary conditions in this beam? In this beam, the boundary condition would be at x is equal to 0, the v is equal to 0 because you see it's a roller support at the left end. And the second boundary condition would be at x is equal at x is equal to 0. I'm sorry, that x is equal to L, the slope of the beam would be 0. If you look at this beam here it can move vertically but it is fixed into this rod so because of that it will not have any rotation at this end so it will be dv dl is equal to 0. So once you have these two boundary conditions you applied it into the equation of the elastic curve you will be able to calculate these two constant of integration and thereby you will be able to get the equation of the elastic curve. So this is the first problem of the assignment. Um, so that was the first problem that I just discussed. Now there is uh, the second problem if you see there in the assignment. Uh, this is also answering the question at one which one of you all had. Determine the deflection at midpoint of the simply supported beam using Macaulay's method. So you have uniformly increasing load. So from zero it is going to W up at the center of the beam and then it is again decreasing. So the question that somebody asked me is what do we do if we have a uniformly increasing load?
So this is the uniformly increasing load. First thing you have to do is calculate the reaction. So here if the length is L, so the total load on the beam is half omega times L. So the reaction at each of these supports would be omega L by 4. Okay, to write the equation of the moment function, it will be omega L by 4 x minus omega by L by 2 into x. So that is, if you take it at a distance x, this value is omega by L by 2 into x. So this into half into x into sorry, one third x. So this is the equation for x between 0 to L by 2. Now if they, it has increased continuously up to the entire span of the beam, this would have been applicable for the whole beam. So that basically answers the question. So if it has been an uniformly increasing load, then this equation would have been valid for the entire beam. Now since there is a change in the slope of the loading, so from uniformly increasing, it is going to uniformly decreasing here. So because of this, we have to use the Macaulay's function. Now, how do we apply Macaulay's function? So what we do is, we first assume that this uniformly increasing load is over the entire span. So for that, this equation will be applicable for the entire range of the beam. However, over this region of the beam between L by 2 and L, we assume that there is a load which is acting in the upward direction. So basically, the summation of these two load is equal to this. So if I draw it again, this loading can be considered to be equivalent to this loading minus or you can say plus and then apply this load in the upward direction. So this is L by 2, this is L by 2 and this is L, this is L. So if this is W here, at midpoint it is W, so here it is 2W. So this is also W. So now if you want to write the moment function of this beam, what do you get? For this, there will be one reaction here, R1. This is R2. For this case, it will have reactions R1 dash, R2 dash. So the total reaction would be R1 plus R1 dash. Now that R1 plus R1 dash would be equal to the reaction due to this loading, which is omega L by 4. So if you want to write the moment equation for this beam, it will be omega L by 4 X minus half 2 omega by L X into X into X by 3 plus you have to consider this part. So this is W by L by 2 or here it will be X minus L by 2 into X minus L by 2 into X minus L by 2 by 3. Now this term is only applicable for the portion of the beam between L by 2 and L. So what we do is, you can use the singularity function for that part, which is mega L by 4 X minus 
half into 2 omega by L x x into x by 3 plus 2 omega by L by 2 into now you are this is where the similarity function is coming into the picture u by 3. So this is the one equation that you can use to represent the moment function of the entire beam. Now here the discontinuity is in loading is the change in the direction of increment of the uniformly varying load. Here it was increasing, here it was decreasing. Had it been increasing overall over the entire span of this beam, then you would not have needed this singularity function. Only this much, the first and the second term would have defined the moment function of the beam. So because we have the uh, increase in the slope, or I'm sorry, a change in the slope of the uniformly, because we have a change in the slope of the uniformly increasing, uh, changing load of the beam, that is why we are bringing in this second, this last term here, which has a singularity function. So now once you have the moment equation of this beam using that singularity function, and it is a single equation, the rest of the steps is similar to what I have shown to write d2v is equal to uh, d2v dx square is equal to mx over ei and then you perform double integration you perform double integration and you would be able to solve this now again if you perform double integration you will be coming up with two constants of integration so this will give you v is equal to some terms in exp uh, expressions in x plus c1x plus c2 so these are the two constant of integration and you will be again using the boundary conditions. So in this case for the beam, the boundary condition would be at x equal to 0, the deflection would be 0, v is 0, at x is equal to L, again deflection is 0, v is equal to 0. <coughs> so these are the two boundary conditions you will be using to solve this beam. So once again, since you have the moment function using the singularity equation, uh, moment equation using the singularity function, <coughs> the rest of the procedure should be easy to solve. So once again, I encourage you to solve this assignment problem as well, which is on the recallers method. <coughs> so these two problems, the first and the second problem that you have in the assignment, you should be able to solve it after today's lecture. So the first one you have to solve by the double integration method and I have just given you some hints about how to solve, what are the boundary conditions you have to use. Second one is by, you buy Macaulay's method and once you are able to write the moment function of the beam uh, using the singularity function, you should be able to solve it because here the boundary conditions are also simple. So if you have any doubts about the, any of these two problems, you can now ask me and otherwise I once again request you to solve these two problems after the class today. Okay, I have a question. What is the problem with complicated loads and supports? What are the methods available to find deflection in complicated beam? What is theory behind softwares that are available to find deflections in complicated loads or beams? Now, <coughs> the first question that you have is, what is the problem with complicated loads and supports? Now, when I meant, when I said complicated loads and supports, I basically meant um, beams which have um, loadings due to other factors like thermal loads. Now, because of these thermal loadings, what will happen is you do not have the elastic beam theory applicable for these beams. So because of that, you cannot use these methods for solving the beams using the elastic beam theory for complicated loads. Now, what are the methods? Uh, the last method, that is the energy method that I will be covering in this topic, they can be used to some extent to find uh, deflections. Uh, due to this thermal loads or due to fabrication errors. Uh, what is the theory behind softwares that are available to find deflections in complicated loads? Now, different commercial softwares have different uh, theories. Uh, energy methods is one of the uh, theories that is used uh, to solve uh, defle for deflections due to thermal loadings or fabrication errors. There might be other methods which are applicable. So it is always advisable to basically go through the manuals of these softwares and check for the methods. And always um, 
most of the softwares have a technical help that is available and they should also be referred to when you are in doubt about the theories or the methods that are being followed on the, at the background of these softwares. Okay, this is a good question. Somebody is asking me how to determine if the deflection is small or large. Uh, there are several ways. Of, so what you see is uh, this will become more clear when we study the energy methods. But for the time being, I will tell you that there are different uh, ratios between the shear span and the depth of the member, which there are guidelines. So normally, if you go for design codes, they will tell you now when. How do you determine if deflection is small or large? For example, if this unif the theory of the elastic beam th uh, theory behind these methods, that is the elastic beam theory, uh, if you find that the deflection is not small enough, and if you calculate the rotation at any point, and you find that it is not much, much smaller than one, then you I would say that it is not small enough to be neglected. So. If that if you want to find like a numerical value, I would suggest one of the ways is to calculate deflection or rotation and see if how much it is less than one. You now if you find that value to be comparable to one, I would say that then you cannot apply this uniform the, uh, the elastic beam theory like the way we did, which is the easiest method for general use. Now there is no one method which can be said to be the one easiest for all problems. So it depends on the problem. For example, if you get a beam which is having no load discontinuity, I would say double integration method. If you have a beam which has load discontinuity, then it becomes McCauley's method. Now it again depends from problem to problem. So, depends, so the way to find out by looking at a problem and deciding which method is easy is something that you have to gain through experience. The more you solve problems, the more experienced you will be in order to judge which method should be used for a particular problem. Okay, we still have five more minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. Otherwise, we'll meet on uh, Friday that we to discuss the next two methods, which is the moment area theorem and the conjugate beam method. Yeah, I got one more question. When a point load acts on a beam, the shear force diagram changes its point or contraflexure in a vertical manner. But in STAT Pro, the diagram shows slope. Okay, the next question I got is can we use double integration method for analysis if the beam will have different I values? Yes, you can. So, what you will happen is again, you will have instead of load discontinuity, there will be a discontinuity in the I. So for each region of the beam with a different value of i, you will write one different equation. And again, you will have to use the continuity conditions at the intersection of these two regions to solve the constant of integration. So yes, it can be used for solving uh, beams with different values of i. Under what circumstances we can prefer Macaulay's method? Under any circumstances where there is a discontinuity in the m by ei expression, you are welcome to use the Macaulay's method provided you can formulate the moment function or the, any other changes that are occurring or causing the discontinuity. Okay, uh, I'll try to take that question one more time. When a point load acts on a beam, the shear force diagram changes its point of contraflexure in a vertical manner, but in Stratpo, the diagram shows slope, which SFD is correct. Okay, so are you asking if you're asking me? Um, why there is an inclination in the shear force diagram at the point where you are applying the load. I think it is something to do with the graphics that the software is using. But you are right, when, uh, in theory, whenever there is a concentrated load, the shear force diagram basically either goes up or goes down and depending on the load. And so the value of the shear force is slightly, is different basically to the left and right of the point of load application. Maybe to depict that the softwares might have a graphical interface which basically shows the change over a small length in a magnified manner and that is why you see the slope of the in the shear force diagram even though actually it is a instantaneous drop from one instantaneous change from one value to the other. Okay, the another question is under what I just I think I just answered this 
under what circumstances we can prefer Macaulay's method. As I said, any circumstance where there is a discontinuity in the M by EI function, you are uh, you should be trying to use the Macaulay's method using provided you can formulate the M by EI equation using the step function. Is there any special method or procedure to solve vertical beam? The <coughs> The elastic beam theory that I explained was for a horizontal beam, but if you just rotate the axis, it becomes vertical and so it should be able to use this method for beams which are vertical. Okay, so I think the time is up, so we'll stop the discussion today. And if you all still have any more questions for this uh, topics that I covered today, I'll take it at the beginning of the next session on Friday. And otherwise, I'll go ahead with the next two topics, which is moment area theorem and uh, conjugate beam methods on Friday. Thank you.
Thank you.